Test, 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 test. Test, test, test. Test, test. Test. Test, test. Gary's in the back, <laughs> hugging everyone. Hi, everybody. We're going to get started. Oh, that was loud. Welcome to the Dramatists Guild's second national conference. <laughs> Woo! I'm Seth Cotterman. I'm the manager of online media at the Dramatists Guild. And today, we're going to talk about new media what it is, how it affects us, and ultimately how to harness the resources that are available. Um, Gwydion is going to start us off, um, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. Um, then we will open, uh, then we'll talk, we'll have a discussion about all of this new media stuff. And, um, and then we'll open up to questions in the room and to our audience online. So if you're watching us live on HowlRound TV, tweet to us using hashtag SayDG or new play. Um, Go ahead and cover your ears. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Gwydion Sullivan. Uh, I knew Gwydion long before we ever had the chance to meet through his blog, and I have a great deal of respect for him. Um, first and foremost, he's a playwright. His plays include Reels, The Butcher, Hot and Cold, Abstract Nude, Constellation, Lead X, The Faith Killer, Cracked, and The Great Dismal. He's a founding member of The Welders in, in DC, he contributes to HowlRound, 2 a.m. theater, Adaptistration, the dramatist, stage directions, all on top of writing for his own blog and being incredibly active on social media. I'm sure most of you have met him already through Twitter. Um, 
Uh, for 15 plus years, he's been a communication strategist, consulting arts and cultural organizations, nonprofits, federal government agencies. He's also the newly appointed project director for the National New Play Network's New Play Exchange. And is the Dramatist Guild regional rep for DC. Aside from all of that, Gwydion, I think, is one of the smartest, most passionate, and sincere guys I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. And frankly, I would jump at any opportunity to sit in a room and chat about new media with him. So <laughs> I'm just as uh, anxious to have the session today. Uh, with all of that said, I will throw it over to you. Hi. I want to start by, uh, this, is the, this is the moment in the performance where uh, somebody usually tells you to turn off your cell phone. <laughs> or if you're at you know, a relatively open-minded new media organization, you might get told, hey, leave your cell phone on and tweet about whatever you see. And I'm going to say a third thing. Make a choice. Do whatever you like. If you want your cell phone on, you want to tweet about what you see, you want to follow along the chat that's happening on Twitter while we're in here, you want to Facebook about something, you want to take my picture and post it, uh, please just wait until I'm not picking my nose. <laughs> uh, but if you want to shut it down and you want to you know, use that as a way to help you pay more attention to what's happening in the room, that's great too. You know your own mind better than I do. You know how you, your mind works better than I do, so make a decision for yourself and I support whatever you do. So, <sighs> the title of the, the event today is a little bit misleading. We're not really here to talk about social media. What we're here to talk about is uh, the, the ways in which the governing metaphors by which we organize human culture are changing. Now, I want to acknowledge an intellectual debt now because uh, some of you may have already recognized my little illustrations here and uh, uh, know where I'm going. I, want my, I have an intellectual debt I want to pay to Stephen Johnson. Has anyone read Stephen Johnson in this room? If you have not read Everything Bad is Good for You, I highly recommend it. But the book in particular from which I uh, drew a ton of my inspiration is called Future Perfect. Uh, it's about the shift to peer network culture in the United States, really worldwide. Uh, and so that's a lot of where this comes from. All right, I'm going to walk you through each of these three images, and then we're going to talk about what they mean and, and where they're coming from. The very first image on my right is an abstracted map of the Paris train system as it was first built. Really efficient, they thought. If you lived anywhere out in the suburbs of Paris, you could get into the city center. It served everyone's needs. Unless you're this person, and you need to get here. It's actually the very least efficient possible system. This would be a lot more efficient. And yet this hub and spoke model, you'll hear me talking about that a lot, actually uh, became incredibly popular and got replicated all around the world. Every train system originally looked something like that. It, it, it skipped from trains to airlines. This is a map of how airlines were constructed in the United States. There were major hubs for each airline, and they traveled to nearby cities. And you could connect from one hub to another hub and radiate out to the uh, local places from there. Now, this, this map also happens to be a map of the way AT&T originally planned its switchboards. So if you wanted to place a telephone call from Boulder, Colorado to Tempe, Arizona, you went from Boulder to the main switchboard that connected you to somewhere else, that connected you to Tempe, and from the Tempe switchboard you went to a local residence. This is how traffic moved through the telephone networks. This is the way we thought in the 20th century. This is the way we built and designed everything. Welcome to the 21st century. This is essentially, among other things, a map of how bits of data are transported through the internet. Each node in what's called a distributed peer network, because any two nodes are peers with one another, 
Each node knows the basic rules for interacting with the nodes nearest to it, and that's it. So if you send an email from here to here, the email can be split up into tiny fragments, follow a million different paths, and when it gets to its destination, become reassembled and magically appear in your inbox. The burden of sending that message from here to here is distributed throughout the network. And all it needs is a set of rules to govern the connections between any two peers in the network. This is the 21st century. So now, this is the shift, this is the cultural shift that we are all living in right now. This is affecting everything we do. This is the move from multinational corporations with big hierarchies to nimble, non-hierarchical startups innovating on the edges of technology and culture. This is the move from centralized government bureaucracies, big, big, big bureaucracies, to decentralized leaderless revolutions. This is the United States government. This is the Occupy movement. <laughs> this is any government in the Middle East, and this is Arab Spring. This shift is happening, and we are all caught up in it. This is television broadcast. You have local networks, you have major national networks, and they are broadcasting out and wide to the communities around where they're located. This is cell phone cameras, iMovie, and YouTube. This is anyone is a broadcast network as soon as they want to be. You just need to know the, you know, the rules to govern your exchange with the peers in your network. So this same metaphorical shift is affecting not only all the things you know, in, the worldwide, in the culture worldwide, but the ways in which we communicate and the ways in which we make theater, the ways in which we work as playwrights. We are moving from a one-to-many world where communication is about I speak and you listen, to a world in which we have a one-to-one -one exchange whenever we can, or a one-to-few, and instead of I, I talk, you listen, the governing, the governing ethos for audiences is, I want to participate. I want to join in. I want to create culture with you. The, I like to talk about how there are young audience members now, people who are buying theater tickets, who have essentially never been thinking people in a world in which the internet didn't exist. In the internet, you create a narrative by the click choices you make. You don't absorb a narrative. You say, I go here, and then this happens to me. I go here, and then this happens to me. I choose this. I customize this, and then this happens. Uh, it's a give and take. This is deeply embedded in the cultural consumption <coughs> modes of young audiences. They want a theater that is participatory. Instead of a fourth wall, surrounding this node or surrounding a stage, we now have immersive theater. You walk in, you play with things, you interact with actors, you, you shout when they tell you to shout, you uh, take a prop and wrap it around your head because they told you to do that as I did in a, a fringe festival show in DC earlier this year. Replacing the fourth wall is immersive theater. Instead of resident acting companies, we now have devising ensembles, resident acting companies, actors arrayed around an institution to support the plays that that institution decides to produce. We have devising ensembles. Hey, let's bring this person in, let's bring this person in, let's use this core of people, let's do this, and let's make a thing. This is the way of the future. Instead of institutional productions, big productions made by big institutions, we are shifting slightly toward a self-production world. Make your own work. Build your own little network in the, in the, uh, within the peer network and, and bring your own work into the world. Instead of dynamic pricing, where the institution says, here's how much it costs for you, audience member, to enter the institution, and I control the dynamics about that pricing, we are moving to a pay-what-you-can model 
for a radical hospitality model. We just had a big theater in DC, Forum Theater just announced that its shows all of next year will be uh, pay what you can. Every show, every ticket. Uh, forum Theater. Yay Forum, if you're watching online. Um, and Yay Mixed Blood and all the other theaters that are doing it all over the country. Instead of big brick and mortar institutions in general in the world, People are focusing on the digital presences of organizations, which are always available to you, always on. You can always have an exchange with them. In a, in a theater, in a big, big building theater, the doors open at whenever in the morning, and they close when the show is out, and you doesn't have to go home, but you can't stay there. You can always interact with a brand of a theater online, on Twitter, Facebook, on their website. So. Instead of, oh, and instead of these big shows happening in theaters, we've got more people bringing shows to where people are. We've got site-specific theater. We've got shows in the lobbies of warehouses. We've got shows uh, in Chinese restaurants. We have shows wherever people happen to be congregating. We're bringing theater to the people instead of bringing people into the theater. The big shift for us in this room is that queries and submission packets are increasingly being replaced by social media and new technologies. So instead of all of us in this room standing around the castle, hoping we have the right papers to be let in, my agent signed this, I swear. I got a master's degree from, uh, uh, my synopsis is exactly 150 words like you said. <laughs> Please, can I come in? Instead of that waiting to be let in, we are connecting with theaters at all times of day, at 1 in the morning on Twitter, at 4.30 a.m. when you're milking the cows on Facebook. Um, instead of these formalized, routine ways of communicating, we now have this great, egalitarian, democratic meritocracy of tweets. You say it, and if what you say is smarter or more clever or more entertaining than the next person, it rises to the top. It gets more attention. It gets more retweets. It gets more mentions. You don't have to have the right credentials. You just have to know how to interact and engage with people. You just need to know the rules for how to exchange and interchange and engage with the person next to you, the person you're staring at, virtually staring at. That's all you need to do. And all of a sudden, you'll find out that you're in a network that consists of you and you and you, and you form your own little triangle. And then all of a sudden, those are not just you know, temporary triangles, but they get a harder black line um, in the drawing because you've, you've cemented a relationship and you've got a real relationship. But at the beginning, you know, let's start with this model. You, 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 can, you may be affiliated with this institution, but you can tweet to this person at this institution and this person at this one. And then the three of you can decide to do a thing together. And all of a sudden, there are real connections. And this graph starts to look one notch more like this one. More and more and more that happens, the more this is going to look like this in the real world. So we are here today. And the conversation that I'm going to have in front of you with Seth is, is really not how do I get on Facebook? What do I do to tweet right? And we can talk about those things. But it's really about learning how to thrive and survive and even prosper as these governing metaphors of the 20th century become the governing metaphors of the 21st century. How do you need to start to think about yourself as a brand, as an artist, how do you need to express yourself, engage with your peers, with your, with your colleagues at theaters and your colleagues in other disciplines in these milieus so that you are successful? If you, if you want to understand why to get comfortable with, say, Twitter and Facebook, that is why. Because this is where the world is going. And if you stay back here, you're going to get left behind. So we can talk about how to get comfortable and do those things, and I'm sure Seth is going to bring that up, but that is why. Don't forget why. So that's, that's all I've got to say by way of introduction, and now um, Seth's coming on back up.
right, well, I'm going to get comfortable. We're going to talk. I'm going to get uncomfortable, <laughs> perched on the edge of this what, little whatever thing. Whatever you yeah. need to do. So I want, to, I want to start broad and then kind of narrow in as we go along. Yeah. Um, that this, all of this shakes out a lot of questions for me, OK? Yeah. So, and I'm sure everyone else. But I think where I want to start is this. The system that we're moving into, that we're in, and that we're going forward into, mm -hmm. it no doubt is empowering. That we all have, we're all on equal footing, that we all have access to the same thing. But to me, what I encounter with people that are hesitant about this is the intimidating factor, the fear of change, the fear of putting yourself out there, of revealing too much, of not knowing what's coming back towards you. So how do you navigate those waters? How do you, how do you get over all of that stuff? To some extent, I want to say that you get over fear of the fear of social media the same way you get over any fear, which is by doing it and realizing you didn't die. <laughs> doing it again and realizing that you weren't grievously injured. Doing it again and realizing, OK, that wasn't so bad. Doing it again and realizing, wait a minute, maybe that was actually a little bit fun. Doing it again and you realize, hey, wait, that person, I've always wanted to talk to that person. And now I just did doing it again and realizing you've made a connection that's valuable, doing it again, getting a production out of it, doing it again, realizing you have a real robust community of people that you feel connected to all the time, all the time. Just show of hands, how many of you in this room have I tweeted with or emailed with? Raise them high, okay. That's, that's, that's awesome, that's like, a fifth of 5% uh, or 10% of this room. Um, that's great. That's awesome. Um, re real relationships uh, you know, come out of uh, Twitter. It's not this, I'm just going to throw 140 characters out into the world and pray. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a way to form substantial, substantial, meaningful connections. I'm just looking at you, for example. Uh, we've had some heart-to-hearts on Twitter. We'd never met until five minutes before this talk, but you've been very supportive of me uh, on Facebook, on chat, you know, chats we've had there, um, and it, it's meant a lot. It's meant it's been very real thing to help my career as a writer, and we never met. Thank you. Well, that segues. So, I mean, I don't know if that answers no, your question. Well, it does. Uh, I, I'm tempted because that segues me like down the list here of questions, but. Before we get into this, because I want to go back yeah, to that, yeah. I want to take just another step back and talk about, you know, I just thought that this would be best that we talk about the things that we ultimately, we're all thinking, and it it's kind of stops us from jumping in. Yeah. The essence of new media is really collaboration. I get information from you, you get information from me, and together we kind of create something based on the various perspectives we're adding. But I, it, again, it seems to me that that is a huge obstacle for organizations and for individuals. Yes, yes, yes. So one thing we inherit, and, and let, me, let me just take a, a step yeah. back myself and say that this was the best possible system we had at the time over here. This is not, hear me really well, this is not to knock the people who built the regional theater system, which is what that's also a map of. They are heroes. They're heroes for what they gave us. They have institutional knowledge. They have cultural knowledge. They went to the, went to the mattresses for us. Uh, they, they built a great system that, did, that gave America a lot of work and gave, gave us something to rebel against. So we should be grateful to them for that. Um, one of the things that we inherit, and that's kind of a neutral word I like to use. So one of the things we inherit from that system is a sense of ourselves as artists in an atelier working alone. Right? I, this is my studio, I do my thing, and when I have finished my thing, I might ask you for a little help along the way, but when I have finished my thing, I deliver it unto you, a finished product. That's what that model sort of emphasizes. You sit out in the suburbs and you take the train in when you're ready to show up what you've done. This model is about communicating all the time. This model is about showing rough drafts to your partner, to your uh, potential partners. It's about working um, in geographically dis and time dispersed um, uh, places on a shared project. So um, 
you know, you might collaborate, you might do a bit of work at 1 a.m. in, in uh, Cleveland, and then at 2.30 the next afternoon, somebody in Boston uh, sends you a sketch for a design for the thing you're writing. Um, this is about the network functioning wherever it is, and uh, collaboration and the connection between the elements of the network being really essential. So we can let go to some extent of what we inherited uh, about being solo practitioners on whom everything, the weight of the, on whose shoulders the weight of the world rests. Well, okay, and then that brings me into this because this has come up several times in people coming up to me before this session about privacy. You know, this is about putting stuff out there. So where do you draw the line between what you put out and what you keep private? And you can take that in many different ways. Yes, yes indeed. Um, I think for me, uh, this is something we're all culturally learning together, where to draw lines. Uh, different people are more or less comfortable with different levels of sharing. And you might be comfortable on Tuesday and realize on Thursday that you were not comfortable. And you might uh, <laughs> realize that you know, on, a, on a November 4th that you've spent six months being too restrained. And you suddenly realize, I need to show more of myself in the world. I think ultimately what's helpful is to have for yourself a clear and well-defined strategy for how you're going to use Facebook and Twitter. And those are the, the two predominant ones, but there are many others, Instagram, um, Vine, uh, and we can talk about all of those, Pinterest. <clears throat> but predominantly the big two, Facebook and Twitter, you need to know in your heart that this is what you're going to do. So I have tended personally to use Facebook for um, rabble rousing and organizing and um, bringing people, convening conversations about causes and sharing pictures of my awesome three-year-old kid. <laughs> um, and I, then I use Twitter for um, connection, banter uh, at the lowest level, ba fun banter and playfulness, and uh, really deep engagement and in-depth conversation uh, with strangers and with people who are only strangers for five minutes and then become best friends uh, thereafter. So <coughs> that's my personal strategy. So in there, you, you heard me talk about my kid and my wife uh, as well, who I also Facebook about, and my personal successes. Uh, I mostly relegate those to Facebook. Um, and I might throw a bon mot about the general culture, or if um, there's a major cultural event, a hurricane, or a political event, I'll join in the conversation on Twitter. But that's more about connecting with my friends and having a shared consumption of culture kind of experience. Um, so I think when you know what the limits are, because you've imposed them, uh, you get a sense of when you have overshared and, um, uh, and it, you're the only arbiter of that. Now I will say that the medium invites oversharing. <laughs> People want to get in uh, Sometimes it's because they want to get into your business and they don't have charitable thoughts toward you. And sometimes it's your friends and they want to support you and you'll get a Twitter hug. <laughs> you get someone will tweet the word hug to you in asterisks and it's because they care about you and they, you know, they want to be there for you. So, um, yeah. There are a few things in that that I want to pull out. Okay, sure. So the thing that you brought up earlier is about branding. Yeah. It's, a, it's a term that we throw around all, all the time, personal mm -hmm. brand. Before new media was ever a question, before it was ever a thing, you were a playwright, a director, a dramaturg, a literary manager, and now with this system, you're all of those things, and now you're also a parent, a chef, a cyclist, a cancer survivor, uh, all of these other things. So how do you prioritize the self you put forward? Again, I think you have to decide what's most important to you, but I would, I would stress that the more you show your full human self to the people in your network, 
uh, that's the glue that binds you to one another. So I may uh, be drawn to your work as an artist in, in theory. I may have even seen your work and, and care about it. But a story is what moves you, right? I mean, we all know this. A story is what moves people. So if I hear a story on Facebook about you, even something as simple as you lost your wallet in the metro and it was at, you were on the way to the hospital to see your grandmother one last time and some stranger found your wallet and brought it to you and there was a reunion and you, you, know, you cried to the stranger or whatever, I'm now moved and I now care about you. I'm, I'm now going to invest in you as an artist. It, these lines that connect us get thicker. The more we travel them, the more well-worn they become. Um, it's like laying down patterns in your brain, connections between neurons in your brain. So, yes, I understand that not everyone is comfortable saying, I got a clean bill of health for my doctor. Um, uh, but when you do, you will be shocked at how many people will say how much it meant to them that you let them into your heart a little bit and how much more they care about you and want to be there for you when you need them to uh, vote for you for something. I, I'm trying to speak at South by Southwest right now and I have put out a call for people to you know, tweet the link to vote for me to get to speak there. I spoke there last year and I want to do it again. And it's only because of the friendships I've made in these virtual networks that that tweet went out and that people went and voted for me. Um, and it's because I tweeted that my son uh, is almost potty trained. I can't wait, actually. <laughs> Honestly, I'm now counting the days until I can put on Facebook that he is fully potty trained. And I can share that because it's an important milestone in my life. Um, he's not there yet, but he's very close. Um, because I know it means something to people. And I love it when other people do it. I love it. I love it. Well, I think that that goes against like our knee-jerk knee reaction whenever we get involved in this. Is like We think that we have to put our professional self forward. We have to, we have to yeah. put on kind of a, a front. Nobody wants are. you to be buttoned up and buttoned down and tidy. They want to see that you will take the risk to get messy with them. That you will show them your flaws. You will show them your broken places and your hurts. Not that you'll be ugly all over the place and there's TMI, right? Too much information. But if you show where you struggle a little bit and you make a real connection and you're a real person, a real genuine person. Remember, this business is all about relationships. Are you going to want to produce someone's play who's kind of standoffish and aloof? Or are you going to want to work with someone who uh, is willing to converse with you and connect with you? You know, candidate, the candidate who gets selected is the one that people say they want to have a beer with. You want to be the one people want to have a beer with. So to, to whatever your brand's version of that, maybe it's a glass of wine and not a beer. Maybe it's a coffee. <laughs> maybe it's uh, confide your innermost secrets. You want, to, you want people to want to connect with you. Mag personal magnetism. This is not always easy for us. We would always rather talk through our plays and let our work talk for itself. That world is over. That world is over. You are always an advocate for yourself in social media. You are always there. You are always there. When I look for someone and they are not on Twitter, I think <laughs> I want nothing to do with them. <laughs> nothing. It's true. Because they're not. I can't. Because they're not. They're not in my. They're not there. They're not accessible to me. So okay. So then this brings up the point about. I mean, look. It's all relationship based. Yeah. But the truth is, we don't all interact the same way in the real world. So that has to translate online. So are there traits that we should work to develop? Or is there a formula for really, or what is it? You know, I think your personality will out. So I, I tweet with, I'm just suddenly coming to mind this, uh, um, she's a playwright and also a philosopher. And her tweets are incredibly erudite. I'm not going to say her name in case any of you know who I'm talking about, for those of you who I tweet with. Um, because it's very much her style. And so Twitter conversations with her are these, the way philosophers kind of bash up against each other with vicious arguments about the tiniest points. And you're like, oh my goodness, it's a semantics. Just leave it alone. But that's what she wants to do. But she's always, what she is, is herself, her authentic self. Right? So she does invite 
Her version of have a beer with you is wrestle over the placement of a pronoun <laughs> in, in a synopsis, right? Um, and so, you know, I think you can bring your authentic self, whatever that looks like. But there's no not bringing yourself. That's what doesn't work. If you're going to stay home, stay home. And I do have to just, you know, put on the table with this. There is something about being in, involved in this new media world that, like, you become very self-aware. Even in, like, just trying to create a bio in 160 characters for Twitter or writing a summary on LinkedIn, you really kind of figure out who you are. You know... We Yes, and so this actually, and this loops me back to your very first question about the fear. I've recently edited my Twitter bio for the first time since I wrote the thing. Um, I had written something like, uh, Gwydion Sullivan writes stories that he hopes will make his son one day proud of him. Something like that, which is true, I do. And I realized that all of a sudden I had these affiliations to the welders, to NNPN, to the Dramatist Guild, and that I really needed to be saying these more professional things because I wanted people to know who I am and what I'm part of. And so I revised it. And then two days later, I was like, oh, I can do better. And I revised it again. And then about an hour later, I was like, oh, I can save some characters and add this other thing. And I went back and I revised it again. This is the beauty of social media. It's ephemeral. The average lifespan of the average tweet Four seconds. Four seconds. That's the average. Most tweets are gone in a second. So there are a few people who are cranking that average up a ton because their tweets get retweeted and they have a lot of followers, so the tweet is there you know, in, to be seen for longer than four seconds. So if you do something wrong, if you tweet something ugly, it'll go. You know, we'll just go like this. <sighs> gone. It's gone like that. It's gone. It's totally gone. Someone may have saw it. Someone may think, wow, that was a weird thing. But they've, they've moved on. Their attention span is on the next tweet that's come down the pike. So, I mean, the other thing I will say is I've made mistakes. I have tweeted too much. I have forgotten when I was tweeting that I was tweeting with a real human being instead of a brand. I have said insensitive things that friends have taken offense at. I have had Facebook posts that have gotten a little more heated than I wish they had. Uh, in all of that, I am just like everyone else. I am human. I, I do what any human being does when you make a mistake. I seek people out and I apologize. I, I just let it be a real thing. So um, I've taken a break from social media. I did this recently. I took, I'm, I'm preempting one of your questions, am I not? It's fine, let's go with Sorry. it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, recently I took a week off. <laughs> That's a big deal for you. It's a big deal for me. You know, it's funny. So I, I, I looked at, I was on Twitter last night tweeting with the um, artistic director of uh, the African Continuum Theater Company in DC. We were actually, having a Facebook chat, a private Facebook chat, and tweeting at each other at the same time. Um, and um, we, were, we were chatting about a, a new initiative we're going to work on in, next year in DC, but um, she asked me about Twitter, uh, and she said something like, my daughter's tweeted 3,600 times, oh my gosh. And I just went over to my Twitter bio and I looked at it and I've tweeted about 35,000 times. And I told her that. She was like flabbergasted, jaw dropped to the floor. And then I told her about my friend David Lohr, who I know tweets <laughs> with at least some of you in this room, who has tweeted as of last night when I checked his Twitter bio 145,000 times. And I realized I was okay. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> I'm, per, I'm not oversharing. I'm not overdoing it. I'm just you know, <laughs> participating in the conversation. Um, not that he is oversharing and overdoing it. God, David, if you're watching at home, we love you. Oh, I'll check the Twitter. I'm yeah, check the in. Twitter. <laughs> um, he's like that. He, he's, he is watching. You're watching. Uh, great. Um, 
he, he's, like the, he's like, if you are a theater practitioner of any kind, he is like your ever-present host. He is always there to greet you and welcome you into the conversation, banter with you, make you feel at home. Um, he is just a good egg. What's his David Lord, L-O-E-H-R, and his Twitter handle is at D Lore. Um, and thank you. You, you, you can write me the check later, David, for the follower who just got <laughs> out of this room. Um, so, you know, I took a, I took a, to go back, I took a week off. Um, I had gotten into a actually relatively unheated argument, but an argument nonetheless, a debate more than an argument about something in DC. And um, a, 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 an organization I've been affiliated, or I am affiliated with, and that I care about a lot, and I was calling into question a decision that they had made, and um, I thought it was a sort of intellectual debate. Like, is, I was asking earnestly, is this thing they're doing right? What do people think? And people chimed in. And then I went to bed. And in the morning, the friend who runs that program said, I can't believe you didn't just ask me what, what, you know, to have a conversation with you. Why did you do that in public? And, um, and, I, and, I, and it hit home. And I realized that even a social media expert, a guy who gets brought to the Dramatist Guild conference to talk about social media, <laughs> can make mistakes. And I want you all to know that. Like, it is possible to screw up. And if you apologize and make it right and make amends, the, the same way you would apologize if you snapped at your husband or um, you know, blew a friend off that you felt bad about. And it's not excusing bad behavior, but it's just admitting that you're gonna behave badly because we all do, because we're human uh, in public and, and um, don't let that stop you from living. Don't let that stop you from living. And now my friend and I are fine, right? You know, uh, we had a really great, earnest conversation about it. And, and in fact, I think I'm actually better friends with her now because we had an awkward encounter together. So um, I took a week off and I realized I recommitted to my purpose of, which I already had. Honestly, I'm overstating the case here, but I recommitted to civility in my conversation I recommitted to um, listening, to thinking before I tweeted, um, uh, as much as I can. Sometimes it's a rapid fire medium, but even one second is better than not, no second. Um, and, and yeah, I think I'll stop there. OK. This is hard for me, because like now I want to go in like four different directions. Um, A lot of the, the things that we're, are coming up here yeah. isn't just us molding ourselves to go online, but how being online is molding us in the life we live. Mm. It's, I, no, I might be making this up, but for me, it feels like being online and having so much of myself out there, I actually interact with people in the real world so much easier. So I, I mean, I, I don't know if that's something to build off of, but it just seems like our mindset whenever we go into this is, you know, I have to change what I am, I have to change what I do, and it actually comes back to us. There's something about the whole world that just kind of makes us a more whole human being. I don't know if this is going to respond to what you just said, which Probably I find not. fascinating. <laughs> uh, no, I find it fascinating. I remember very clearly, there's a hashtag on Twitter, uh, some of you will be familiar with, 2AMT, pound 2AMT. The T is theater, so 2AM is the time, 2AM. Um, I had been tweeting on that hashtag, and I have been now for years. When I was going to New York for something I can't recall, reading in one of my plays, and I sort of casually said, hey, anyone in New York who follows the 2 a.m. theater hashtag want to get together? And instantly there were sort of eight of us who agreed to meet and have a meal, have a coffee, and then, knowing that we had this real-world event coming up at which we were all going to be in each other's presence, we all tweeted a lot together for uh, two, three weeks before it happened. And by the time we met in person, it was a real love fest. <laughs> it was people, I'd, I'd paid attention, I'd watched their, um, uh, 
the trials and tribulations of their everyday life. I couldn't get a babysitter. I got a babysitter. I broke my leg. I got, I landed a production at this thing. Uh, I'm worried about re whether I'll get revisions done for this time, for this deadline, etc. And I feel like I knew them. And there was a kind of a shorthand. And it's not anything I couldn't have rationally written a bio for too many of them, or maybe some, you know, one sentence, so-and-so is a so-and-so. But I, I felt connected to them. So that when we showed up, I think all of us who were there remember it as a really profound time that we spent in each other's presence. It was really a meeting of, um, of old friends for the first time. So yeah, I think Twitter is, uh, Twitter and Facebook um, kind of, it's almost like they grease the skids for a friendship when you get the chance to make one in person. And as a playwright, do you think that being so active on social media and, and all of that stuff has impacted your writing and the writing process? Yes. The writing, the actual writing. So I would also say that they've, it's radically impacted. I have landed more productions from my presence on Twitter than from anything else I've done in the last three years. Did you hear that? I'll say it again. I've landed more productions from being on Twitter and from anything else I've done in the last, like, three years. There's your incentive to get on Twitter right there. Um, I will say that I am less interested than ever in just telling a story and letting people sit back and watch it. And I think that that is partially because of um, being so immersed all the time in a two-way communication world or a multi various multi-level threaded communication world. I am much more interested in engagement, in experience design for an audience. Mm -hmm. What am I going to, what kind of experience am I going to curate for the people who are coming to see a show or see a performance? Uh, much more interested in, I, I have stopped seeing, as I wrote in my HowlRound column this last last week, I've stopped seeing things like blog posts about a play as like necessary marketing evils and more as an actual extension of the storytelling itself. Um, you know, I, I think in transmedia terms instead of in old media terms. So, I mean, so this is, this is kind of my thing is, and you brought this up earlier, if we can assume that it's impacting your work, it's also impacting your audience. And we can't think about those in silos. Like, they have to come together. So do you write now thinking about an audience? You do. Engagement. That's what you're after, because you think your audience wants that. I do. I mean, a little bit. You know how this business works, right? You take years to develop a play. So some of the work that I'm developing now that's coming to fruition, I just came last week. I was in Naples, Florida, workshopping a play for a week. It's a traditional play. It's going to be actors standing on a stage, saying their lines not to an audience, just to each other. There'll be a fourth wall, all that stuff. And I love this play. I love it. Um, but the stuff that I'm incubating now and starting now is going to be completely radically different. Mm -hmm. I'm going to create theatrical experiences with the full expectation that people will come with their entire digital worlds, their iPads or whatever, with them. The cloud, the social cloud that lives around every human being, the digital social cloud, will come with them into the theater space. And again, they may choose, as I offered you the choice, to ignore that cloud and be present in the room with others. And they may choose to be both present and present virtually with their extended audience, with the extended audience, and, and issuing forth some of what's happening in the room out into the digital space. And they may really retreat and watch the performance from a kind of a distance and engage more in what feels like a safe zone. I, you know, I can't control that. I don't really want to control that. I, I realize that, I, that, that there's a part in all of us, I think, that wants attention. Look at me. Look at me. Um, that's not a healthy part of us, <laughs> I don't think. That is not a reason to tell a story. It's not a reason to be a dramatist, to get attention. You have to tell a story for people. You have to tell a story to serve an audience. 
And so you serve them by meeting them where they are and giving them an experience that works with them wherever they are. I felt the whole room kind of go <gasps> whenever you held up your iPad to say that you were bringing, this was coming yeah. into the theater. Can, can we have like that little kind of heated discussion about, do you think that it pulls someone in or distracts them from what's being Yes, done? we can have that heated discussion, sort of. Okay. <laughs> all um, moderation. All too often, the debate about social media gets reduced to, should we have tweet seats or not? <laughs> I don't care about tweet seats. If you want to cordon off some section of your audience and say, this is the place where people can have their phones open and their glowing screens on their faces, and they'll only annoy each other so that they can tweet what was happening, that's like an attempt to control the energy that's happening and it's, I guess, fine if it's fine for your audience. But that's missing the whole point. It's missing the whole point. The point is that every one of us in this room has a social cloud around us. For so, some of us have digitized that cloud. Some of us are on Facebook and Twitter. <coughs> some of us have those digital representations with us on our iPads and our phones. Some of us stay deeply connected to those things. Some of us are only temporarily or lightly or briefly connected to those things. One of the reasons I love my iPad is that it's a very light connection to those things. It's there, but it's, it doesn't interfere. My phone is a little more personal. And it, it, it's right here in my pocket over my heart. You know, it's, it's there. So I take it out before I do this talk because I don't, I don't want to feel like that cloud. I want to be here in the room with you all. So I actually turned it off. I turned off my cell phone and my iPad. I turned the Wi-Fi off. Um, so I would be disconnected from them and present with you all. And that's just the choice I made. So Thank you. you're <laughs> um, I think also I knew Seth would be connected to uh, Twitter and he could do that for me. Um, I think that if our, it is our job as artists to create cultural experiences that serve people. We can't serve the people we want to serve. We have to serve the actual human beings that are in front of us. And like I say, those human beings are increasingly carrying around these clouds in their hearts and in their heads. They're thinking about um, a, a conversation they had on Twitter. They're thinking about, wouldn't my Aunt Sally love this play? They're thinking about, I'm liking being here, but I'm feeling a lot of pressure to meet my uh, girlfriend for wine after the play, and I need to tell her at intermission where I am, and blah, blah, blah. They're thinking about, I love this experience, and I want to be part of it, and this experience is curated to include a chance for me to add my voice to the piece. So, I mean, more and more work we are seeing invites you to tweet, invites you to... Um, Facebook invites you to take pictures and share them. I had a play produced in New York uh, called Abstract Nude last year, and the theater company, it was about a piece of art, the theater company asked any, everyone in the audience, whenever they felt like it, to take a picture of what was happening on stage and upload it via an app they built for this purpose. And they, through the night, collected all of the images that were uploaded, and then at the end of the play, there they were. They had formed slowly the backdrop that was happening in the play. They were the, literally the back of the play was images of the play taken by the audience. So cool. And, but it worked because the piece that I created was adapted for that purpose. Right? It was, it was art intended to be responsive to the digital world we're living in. That's what the conversation is that we need to be having, not about tweet seats. It don't, doesn't matter if you want to let people tweet while they're watching Willie Loman grieve and you know, rail about the injustices in his life or not. It's fine either way. Arthur Miller didn't make his play for that. It, it, it could be interesting. We could say, let's produce Willie Loman, let's do Death of a Salesman, and let everyone tweet, and over the course of a run, gather all of the tweets that were tweeted during performances and do some art project with all those tweets. The thoughts about Willie Loman, tweets about Willie Loman, and make turn this into some kind of blog post or some other piece of art, some other extension. That could be cool. But, but that's missing the point. The 
point is we have to think of ourselves as content providers, as artists, as curators of experiences, some of which will resemble the traditional theatrical experiences we all know and love, and some of which will look a little bit different and be a little more interactive and have digital components. Can, can we talk about the welders? Yes, I didn't know you were going to ask me about the welders. I know, I, it just occurs to me that, I mean, what role does, did new media play in getting you to this point and what role will it play going forward? Do I need to tell people who the welders are and what the Probably a little are? bit. Uh, uh, collective of Playwrights in DC uh, launched ourselves to the world about a month ago, uh, inspired by, but drifting off from 13P, familiar with 13P. So uh, five playwrights and one executive and creative director. We are gonna spend three years producing each other's work. And then the difference between us and 13P is they imploded when they were done we're handing the whole thing over to another generation of playwrights in DC. So um, lock, stock, and checkbook. Logo, website, bank account, board of directors, 501c3, we're giving it away. We wanted to build a platform for um, uh, playwrights to interact more immediately in the unmediated, non-institutionally mediated way with audiences. Um, so, what I mean, that's, that sounds like new media. That's this the whole model thing. right here. That's, we don't need a big institution connecting us to audiences. We, we are creating a neutral platform that will work hopefully with five new playwrights when we're done. My, my uh, question was just sort of, how did it play into getting to where you are now and what will it play going Well, forward? I mean, it pl in, in pedestrian ways, honestly, um, the first, as we, the first conversations we had were me emailing two of my fellow welders who were not fellow welders at the time, just friends, and I said, it's time. And then we literally spent four hours on Gmail. It was the <laughs> silliest thing we ever did. We had a thread, we just had a, con we just emailed each other for four hours, sat in our respective offices emailing. Um, and now we actually run the organization largely through Google Plus Hangouts. Um, so we meet every other week, uh, and every other one of those meetings is a virtual meeting. You know, we're all over the D.C. area. It's not always easy for us to get together in person. And so almost all of what we do happens there. We use other digital tools like Basecamp and um, uh, um, Google Docs mm -hmm. and all kinds of new media tools to run a virtualized organization. There's not a brick and mortar location. Uh, and there never will be. I was just generally, like, yeah. I was actually just interested. Yeah. Okay, so can we go back to talking about, well, hello. Hey, it's fine. Woo, bells. <laughs> Someone tweeted that a phone rang. Yeah. Um, Someone tweeted, yes. <laughs> thank you, it was you, Herman, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, let's go back to talking about strategy. Yeah. Is this a term that you use as uh, only an organization, or can you actually use the term strategy as a person starting into all this? I think every person should have their own personal um, social media strategy. And how do the various platforms weigh into that? However you want them to weigh in. So uh, I use Pinterest when I, for example, when I'm gathering inspiration for a new play. I gather images that make me feel like my play, or that explicitly look like the characters I'm creating, or the set. And I have a Pinterest gallery of images for each play. I've done that only for two or three of them. Uh, but it has proven useful when I bring on a designer. Mm -hmm. I can say, here's my inspiration source. And they have it there. So you, you kind of have this broken up into tools that you, tools that you use, yeah. and then communication that you yeah. use. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I think that's fair. Can, is it fair to ask the question, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on Twitter. We have today, I think. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason why we talk? I mean, there are more people on Facebook. I, is there a? Way more people on Facebook, but uh, they are uh, graying. So kids and Facebook do not mix. Um, it's, um, I, I'm not going to say that I see doom in Facebook's future because they've got too much money and they'll figure it out. Um, but. Twitter is the new hotness, as the kids say, and Facebook is um, old and busted. Um, and then there's Google Plus. There's Google Plus, which is more of a tool, I yeah. think, for me, a logistical tool. 
I don't know. I think Twitter is more about ideas and uh, more, it's, it's more, I don't know. Here's, here's my question. I think it's all, uh, my only answers to you would be coming from my own personal strategy, why I use Twitter the way I use it. So naturally, all the people I follow, with maybe the exception of my next door neighbor, Ben, uh, are theater people. Mm -hmm. So I don't interact with Ben very often because the you know, 800 people I follow are 799 of them theater people. Uh, so it isn't just that every person fits every platform. It isn't, you don't just fall into place. No, I mean, I, no, I, I think there are people who can rationally say, I'm, uh, I'm ignoring uh, Facebook. I just don't want to do it. I don't care to share my personal life. Uh, and I don't need it to be a dramatist. I think it's harder to ignore Twitter. Uh, I think it's much harder to ignore Twitter. So let me ask the last question, and then we'll open it up for the room and then online. This is what everybody says. I can't be involved in new media because it takes too much time. How do you manage your time? Um, wish I were better at it. I have a three-year-old, so I've learned to survive with less sleep. Um, <laughs> I think people make a mistake that they feel like they tweet and then they hang out and there's nothing to do. What do they do? They just tweeted. Um, you have to cultivate and curate your Twitter experience. It takes an investment of time up front, taking time to follow people and um, decide these are the people I want to hear from, I'm interested in, watch conversations other people are having on hashtags and think, this person has a point of view that I, I, I respect and I can learn from. I want to follow them. The real hard part is that it takes engaging with people, tweeting with them uh, as a stranger, saying hello as a stranger. Uh, you know, it's like going to a party where you <coughs> think about it this way. Uh, you all know from your communities 5, 10, 20, 25, some number of other theater practitioners, and some of them are on Twitter. So the first thing you'll do is you'll get on Twitter and you'll follow all your friends. And so going to Twitter is going to a party at which you know everyone. And it's easy to, to tweet with them, but they're not there at the same time as you are, so it feels a little bit like a party where your friends just were, or your friends might be coming later, so you can leave them a note. So in addition to the friends you've followed, you might spend some time on one of the prominent theater hashtags, and there are really only two of them. Pound 2AMT, which I already mentioned, and Pound New Play. For the duration of this conference, please follow Pound Say DG. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Send me the check. So you I got can it. Pay <laughs> Lord. It's in the mail. Um, uh, you follow those hashtags, and you see what people are talking about. Eventually, you'll see one of your friends tweet on those hashtags. You will respond to your friend, and then some stranger will respond to you, and you'll get in a conversation with a stranger. All of a sudden, that stranger feels a little familiar, and you follow that person. Then they say something provocative, and you feel like you've already talked to them. You can talk to them again, and you'll reply to them again, and another stranger comes, and another stranger comes, and slowly more and more strangers start to become your friends. And the party starts to feel more like it's always on. 2 a.m. theater comes from the fact that a conversation was happening at 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time that was a vibrant, vital, I was not there at the time, a vibrant, vital conversation about the state of the American theater. You can go on 2 a.m. right now, and I guarantee you someone's talking about something. Someone just tweeted a link to an article. Someone just commented on that article. Someone's arguing over whether it should be theater RE or theater ER. <laughs> There's always something. So eventually Twitter becomes a party at which you know a ton of people, and they're always there, and there are a ton of interesting strangers. It's like the best party you've ever been to. You either know everyone and you're happy to see them, or you don't know them and you've admired them from afar, and you're so psyched, oh my god, did you see who's at the party? Or there are people you don't know and you're excited to meet them because you, from experience, have learned you're going to meet cool people. 
And someone there is probably going to work with you at some point. Someone is going to say, do you have a play about gun control? Well, yes, I do have a play about gun control. Well, I'm putting together a festival of readings of plays about gun control. Uh, can you send me your work? And boom, it happens. So that upfront investment is serious, mm. and it can take months, right? I'm not going to lie. It can, take, it can take months if you're not a gregarious person. If you are, it can happen a lot faster. If you already have a lot of friends, and they're already on Twitter, you can... You can get into the flow more easily. After that investment, your time on Twitter can be really casual. You can log in for five minutes, reply to all the people who've tweeted to you. Maybe one of them happens to be there and you banter back and forth about the thing they've tweeted you about. You send a few direct <laughs> messages, which are private messages to your, to your <laughs> dear friends about, oh, did you see what so-and-so did? You play a hashtag game, which is where you sort of, um, um, what was the other one the other day? It was, um, uh, it was like Broadway films with, bro Broadway plays with replace, lesser, lesser Broadway plays. Like, do, were you participating in it? It was like lesser, so they took b titles of Broadway plays and like the 37 step. Uh, you know, and they, you know, um, the gout of a salesman, that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you just you, you make puns with your friends for five minutes and you have fun, and then you go away. So it's like, if you're writing, I love Twitter for this. I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm stuck, I sit there, I'm agonizing, I don't know what to do. Twitter! <laughs> <sighs> I can banter with my friends, um, exercise a different part of my brain. I mean, it's real, this is a real science here. You're, you're using a different, totally different part of your brain the part you were using on your play lies fallow for a second. The neurons kind of quiet down a little bit. They get a little perspective. You've done bantering. You come back, and all of a sudden, you have more energy to attack that thorny problem in Act 2 or the character who isn't resonating. Um, so that's, I mean, my, my Twitter, people say, you're always on Twitter. You're always on Facebook. <laughs> I'm, I'm on Facebook or on Twitter for about a minute and a half every hour. <laughs> so if you add that up, that's like 25 minutes. And it's, again, that, that may even seem like a lot to you, so start with five minutes, and that's fine. I find that that is my, that has replaced all of the energy I spend submitting my work. I submit my work to maybe 10 things a year, period. And I get productions, I get workshops, I get opportunities. I have more than I... Uh, you know, I always want more, so take that back. World, <laughs> give me more. <laughs> but um, it, comes, it comes from just being a part of the larger egalitarian world of communication. Do, do I wish that there were more artistic directors on Twitter? I do, but there are some. Uh, sometimes they seem to scatter when the really thorny conversations happen. Um, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're shockingly accessible. Shockingly accessible. And also celebrities, too, way more accessible than you would think. How many of you know who Ruth Buzzy is? Ruth Buzzy and I follow each other on Twitter and tweet, you know, randomly. Because I found her on Twitter. I was like, oh my gosh, I love Ruth Buzzy. <laughs> Ruth Buzzy, hi, Ruth Buzzy. And she said, hi. And then we started tweeting, and now we're friends. Like that just, that's random and weird. Flavor Flav. How many of you know who Flavor Flav is? <laughs> Flavor Flav and I follow each other, right? I'm going to watch that right now. Totally random. <laughs> what did you say? I was going to watch. I was going to watch for him to tweet you right oh, now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a list of questions here, but I'm sure that this, we have some, several Let's in the room. Let's deal with so the people wanna... in the room first. Yeah, huh? yeah. We'll get to you people, I promise. We'll get, we'll get to you. Uh, if you do have a question, you can talk into that microphone just so we can hear you and the people online can hear you. Do you have a question? Yes. Go for it. We're very informal here. Look, we're sitting on tables. We're drinking water. Okay, so I'm a total novice to Twitter. I don't know anything about Twitter. And I am on Facebook. So, um, but I don't communicate a lot because I go, why are all these people telling all these things about themselves that I would be embarrassed to reveal myself that much? So you did kind of cover that issue, but... I was hoping that I might find out today just how to even get started on Twitter. Do you just 
put Twitter in your computer and get going, or what do you do? You go to twitter.com and you create an account, okay. and you start going. It actually takes about three minutes. That's great. I would, I would say that um, also on Facebook, there are ways to participate on Facebook. I have really given Facebook short shrift in this conversation. There are ways to participate on Facebook that are not about uh, your gout or your, um, your daughter's tonsillectomy. Um, why am I going with gout so much in this conversation? <laughs> My brother has gout, maybe that's it. Um, <laughs> it is kind of a literary disease, right? Um, follow, li like on Facebook all the theaters in your area. Like American Theater Magazine. Like the Dramatist Guild. Yes. If you haven't liked the Dramatist Guild, what are you doing? Come on. Exactly. If you're on Facebook and you haven't liked the Dramatist Guild, your mission is to go like it right away. And I don't need a check for that because <laughs> <laughs> that's for real. That you're, we're all stronger if we're all part of the Dramatist Guild network on Facebook. We're all stronger if we can be connected to one another, learn from one another. So like them. And when they ask a question like, what's your... Uh, new challenge with something, something, you know, I don't know, maybe you issue, maybe you ask some question to start a conversation. Yeah. Uh, you join in and all of a sudden, this is what's happening in this room is happening on Facebook. And it's a, it's not about, um, you know, whether you're going to go to uh, Key West or Orlando for your vacation. It's about um, whether you've seen the new uh, Annie Baker play and what you think about it, which is definitely a conversation I would hope that you'd feel not only comfortable having but eager to have with your other fellow dramatists. And that's, that's how to use Facebook. That's, that's how to use Facebook for your career. We have so many tweets right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read I that wanted fast. to give an example of them, too, of a very positive use of Facebook that I had recently. I received a message from a Paula Rodriguez, who I thought, well, she could have been an actress in one of my plays, but I don't know. She wanted to friend me. So I said, okay. And I took a chance. So then she wrote, all this happened in Spanish, because I'm an international playwright. She said, um, are you the writer? And I said, well, I'm a writer. <laughs> and she said, are you the expert on the Uruguayan act, uh, poet Damir Agostini, who I had written a play about 10 years earlier? And I said, uh, well, I'm an expert, <laughs> I don't know if I'm the expert. And she said, well, uh, we would like to interview you for our radio station in Paysandu, Uruguay, um, uh, about your play and about Domir Agostini is what time is, is good for you. And I said, well, 4 p.m. tomorrow. And she said, um, can we do it via Skype? I said, all right, <laughs> no, it would sound. And um, at that moment, I, um, I, I went to visit the Uruguayan ambassador and somebody from Columbia College, so they listened to the interview the next day, and they loved it, and now they're supporting my upcoming show at the Cervantes <coughs> Institute. And now Paula Rodriguez is in Chicago, I just found out, so I have to contact her so we can meet personally. So I think if you're open to things on, on social media, um, Incredible things can, and it's like, just like the diagram there. Exactly like that. So, anyway, I just wanted to share that. No, that's awesome. fantastic. Let's take a, a Twitter question. Oh, Lord. Okay. I'm going to try and read quicker. Um, <laughs> mostly people are retweeting what things that you've said, which doesn't surprise me one bit. <laughs> Aw. Really flattering things. Hold on. I'm going. <laughs> Now live. Making fun of David Lohr. Are they, are they? Hold on. Let's see what David had to say, because he was in here, too. Um, he says, why am I not there? <laughs> why, yeah, why is he not here? F uh, find one and we'll take another live because there's somebody with yeah, a yeah. hand up. I want to get to her. And then you. Yes, you. Yes. Come on up. You might not recall this, but two years ago, I, you talked to somebody about something about Facebook, and I tried to Facebook friend you, and you said, who are you? Why do you want to Facebook friend me? And I was like, because you're awesome. <laughs> you're like, oh, OK, great. Not my question. Um, briefly, you, you mentioned a, an exchange you had with an organization for whom you had a friend, and you put it on Facebook, and it was kind of a big deal. Yeah. We had a very similar thing recently on HowlRound about um, yes. 
Yeah. You probably read it. Short, short version. I'm um, Bay Area, San Francisco area. Um, uh, the Shakespeare Festival, one of our local writers who's a reviewer um, wrote, some people say stinging article about she went to this outdoor Shakespeare festival, all the rich people had blankets, all the poor people didn't, all the rich people had free food, all the poor people didn't, what is it with this organization, they don't support you know, people coming to see the show that, are, that aren't rich, and, blah, blah. and it became this big hairy deal, which the point I'm trying to make about it with, with your comment is, the director of the festival said, why didn't you call me first before you put this article out? And many of us responded, that's not the freaking point. The point is, this writer went and observed things that she saw and wrote about them, not as a challenge, but as an informational, educational, you know, world-opening view of here's how our audiences might view what they feel is a very elitist system, and not even what you're going to do about it. So I'm curious, like, why you felt that you had to apologize to your friend when you brought up an issue, I assume was a serious issue, and, and to have the world talk about it. I mean, the, why they were upset that you wanted the world to see that you had some questions about it. That's all. Be, um, social media is an echo chamber. It, um, it gives back more of whatever you give it. And so um, sometimes in this world it is important to express your anger and your outrage. And social media does a great job of amplifying that. And sometimes it is important to be uplifting and point out to, to as my friend Travis Bedard, who's probably on Twitter right now, would say, <laughs> to talk about what's good. Hashtag T-A-W-G for fun. Sometimes it's important to talk about what's good and let the echo chamber of social media amplify that as well. Build circles of positivity. I think I, in that case, I asked a kind of neutral to negative question when I might have asked, a, asked it in a more positive ah, way. Okay. And, um, and so, you know, heck, over-apologize and, and, um, and make sure that um, people you love know you love them. I think that this is a, an open question. Yeah. Uh, what is your version of a hangout with me? <laughs> that was on a Twitter thing. Who? who, who? <laughs> B. Uh, Viello Davis? Well, hello. Hi. Was that an open was that an open question, or was that a, a was that for Gwydion, or is that an open question? Oh, well, never mind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is there, uh, is David there a... David Lohr actually said, you know, social media is really about advocating for other people. That, that's kind of a conversation that was going on here. Yeah. It's not just about advocating for yourself. It's about advocating for others. Really put uh, really um, one of the most so I have a blog. Um, some of you may have read at some point something I wrote. One of the most popular posts I ever wrote. I just picked 77 as a random number, and I wrote, made a list of 77 things I thought were pretty spectacular about DC theater. That's it. Names of actors, pre-show meals you could get near a certain theater, um, a, a season of all female playwrights that I liked. Uh, you know, just random things. And that's all I did. Like, I just want to say a lot of nice stuff. It was inspired by Travis, Travis Bedard's um, talk about what's good. And um, I think the more that you put that energy out in the world, the more you're there for others. It really, really, again, it's an echo chamber. You get back what you put out. And I'm, believe me, if you know me at all, I'm not a kind of karma, touchy-feely kind of guy. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm just talking about re in real practical terms. You tweet a nice thing about somebody because you, from the heart, not just to do it, they're gonna be there for you. It just, you're just cementing a social relationship. You're building a, a network, a real fabric, real ties between people. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's why I, you know, to answer the apology question again, uh, I just want to be putting good out into the world as much as I can, uh, as I think that comes back. Uh, uh, you and then you and then I have two more. Okay, yeah. Uh, question on Facebook. Um, so apparently you don't accept everybody who tries. No, to I did. I say you. yes to you and become your friend eventually. Ultimately, I don't. ultimately you did, but not I, originally. Apparently. Yeah. So my question is, <laughs> I, I do I do Facebook and not Twitter, and I think I'm doing it all wrong because I get requests from people or friend requests, 
If I don't recognize them at all, I just ignore it until I keep doing it. And then I'll click on them and see, hmm, do they look interesting? Do I like them? Do I? And I make decisions based on that. And now I'm thinking I should just let everybody in. Just Is that the case? Yes. Is that? Yes. And then, since and then I may- figure out if they're, if they're a scammer. Or, you know, I mean, it's obvious if they're somebody um, not nice. But like, if someone wants to connect with you, it's either because they want something from you and you don't want to give it to them and then you can say bye-bye or because they really like you. I like All you. right. So now let me ask you, since I'm a Facebook person and not yet a, a tweeter, does it work differently on Twitter? In other words, no. do, you, do you have the same, do you have to accept people on Twitter? No. Can they well, just... you, some people protect their tweets so that, only, so that they have to allow, it's usually people who are job hunting. They don't want their boss to know what they're doing or they have um, stalkers they're trying to avoid. You know, in some, I'm really, I'm not making light in real situations like that. Um, people need to protect themselves, but no, anyone can follow you. Anyone can follow and, and you, get a no, you get an email saying so-and-so followed you, um, and that's it. Do you want to take a question from Twitter? Uh, keep going. Go. Keep yeah. going. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Um, you actually back there, and then you uh, in front. Maybe we can, yeah. Hey. Hey. Uh, so I'm actually not a novice at this. And awesome. I, I just did an interview. I'm really surprised to hear you say that you've gotten so many productions from in the last two years from tweets, from Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, because I just interviewed Ariel Hyatt. Do you know Ariel? She does music, mostly the music business. And I asked her about return on investment, you know, in terms of social media. And she said she equates it to like wanting to make money at a cocktail party. And um, so I would love to hear like, an example of how a tweet one of your tweets led to a gig. Okay, I would say that I would abandon the phrase return on investment and replace it with return on engagement. Uh, because what we're doing is not, it's, this is not a financial transaction. Twitter does not adhere to uh, market norms, it adheres to social norms. Twitter is about building relationships. Relationships are what make theater happen. So um, there is no one tweet that I can point to that got me a production. I can tell you that my relationships with people, uh, m you know, the sense I got and that others got that we liked each other and that we would enjoy working together, uh, facilitated, uh, facilitated us making connections when there were opportunities to work together. So it's, you cannot, cannot do social media because you're hoping you're going to get a production. You do social media to be part of the world, to give to the world, to contribute to this ongoing conversation we're all having, to join, to link up to the network. That's why you do social media. The network then in turn is how theater gets produced. People get to know who you are, they get a sense of what your presence is like, they get a sense of what you care about, of how your mind works, of how your heart works. And they say, I want to work with that person. And then that, that sort of connected energy uh, is there for when, hey, we need a show for our upcoming season. Do you have something? Um, so again, it's not a lever you can pull to get produced. That's, that's really wrong. And if I suggested that, I, I take it back. It is, a, it is a place to be part of the world. I, I think that actually answers one of the questions that we got uh, on Twitter, which was, do you monetize your social media presence with ads? <laughs> that was off the list. <laughs> um, Kyra yeah. Cohen writes, what is the most surprising or perhaps least recognized thing that social media has brought to playwrights around the theater world? Most surprising or least recognized thing that social media has brought to playwrights around the world? Gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> you know what? Ask that question of Twitter. Tell well, Twitter, Twitter, answer that question. Because, ah, excellent. Twitter, answer her question. Can you retweet that question? I'm retweeting. Seth is going to retweet the question this person has answered. Someone on Twitter is going to answer that question better than I can. That's another thing social media is about. I am no longer in my own mind. I no longer have to have all the answers. 
I can Google for the answer, or I can go to Twitter. Last night, last night, I was worried about how to get from Midway Airport to this hotel. Chicago tweeps, can I take the orange line to Roosevelt and walk to this hotel? Four people within seconds answered me and said, oh yeah, you take it, then you walk this way. It's no big deal. That's, someone said, that's why the orange line exists. Right? I didn't know that. I actually lived here for like four and a half years. Uh, <laughs> back in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and the orange line wasn't built. Oh, see, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, but so, so the, the internet, or Twitter, crowdsourced my answer for me. Boom. And someone has an answer already. No, not yet. Oh. Um, someone says that they're surprised you didn't mention YouTube. As the, the greatest thing that Twitter... Uh, that no, 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 just in general. Today. Oh, but I haven't mentioned YouTube. I think we are only now figuring out how to use YouTube. I think the wrong way to use YouTube is to um, simply broadcast our work. I think the, another wrong way, though it seems like the right way to be using YouTube, is to make trailers for our plays. I think we need to be using YouTube to create movies that are extensions of the storytelling on the page. Um, so that we're thinking about um, transmedia storytelling, where a component of the story is a video and a component is on stage. Um, but, you know, I don't know. What do I know? Twitter will have another answer for, for me. The world will have another answer for me. Uh, do, you want to, do we have another question? In the yes, room? this yeah. person right yeah, here yeah. had a question. And then I'm sure there will be others. I was wondering how you think that social media is changing what the website is for, for a writer. That's a good question. It's a great question. Um, I'm actually about to be reinventing my own web presence um, when I get back from this conference. Um, So with the advent of, the, of blogging platforms, which is another part of social media, the, and, you know, Tumblr and, and WordPress and the like, that we haven't talked about at all, to my sorrow, um, you are now your own publisher. Um, that is a gift and a burden. The gift is you need not wait for anyone to approve or accept your work for publication. You just put it out in the world, period, end of story, and people can start interacting with it. That also means that monetizing it is hard, mm -hmm. to use that phrase. It also means that you make mistakes, and you publish too much, and you publish too often, and you, things are not polished when you put them out in the world. And some of that is OK, because people want to see your process. They don't want to see the, the end product. I think we have to think about websites as the version of you that is always available to the world. So you are always there to be interacted with. So your website needs to reflect your personality much more than it needs to have links to all your publications, links to all your reviews, links to your whatever. It needs to just be who you are because people are forming impressions about you by what they find about you when they go there. What you will, the impression you will form about me when you go to my site, if you go to my site, and I don't want to presume that you will, is that the cobbler son has no shoes at the moment. Um, but come back in a week. <laughs> uh, a week and a half. We're getting close on time. Uh, okay. Do you want to take one more from the room and then one more from Twitter? Sure. How about the person way back there who just raised her hand? Hello. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? I had a question about, um, I had a question about earlier when you were talking about branding, and I guess this is part of the website thing also. Um, you talked about, uh, it's all about story, which is really a terrific way to view yourself, but um, with social media, so many, uh, so many other people have input into that story of you. So you're crafting a brand and a story, and then you have this input from a lot of other people. So I wanted to know how do you manage that, and um, how much is story, and how, when does it become like trivia or noise? You know, you can tell, I think we all know this instinctively, you can write a great story, but if it sits in your drawer or on a file on your computer and no one ever interacts with it, is it really a story at all? 
Um, it only becomes a story in some sense when an audience is engaging with it, <clears throat> either by sitting back and reacting or by participating in the telling of it. So in as much as a brand is a story, if you keep it in the closet and you don't express it in the world, um, it's no good. It's just an abstract thing that's unreal. Um, so I think you can't help but be connected in the world and you have your sort of aspirational brand, your, your, um, the, the, the being you want to be in the world, and then you have your lived brand, <clears throat> the way it gets made manifest in your engagements and your interactions with others. And the goal is to keep your lived brand as close to your aspirational brand as you can, and to be willing to do a little navel gazing periodically take a look at your aspirational brand and say, hey, maybe I've evolved in a different way and I want it to be different. Um, less humor, less banter, less hashtag gaming on Twitter and more um, 140 character profundities, for example. Um. Sam Byron tweets to us, do plays now have the ability slash responsibility to break audiences away from their clouds, as well as embracing them? No, God, there's so much hostility toward audience members. <laughs> <clears throat> Why do you think people are gonna keep coming up to see your shows if you're worried about, turn your cell phones off and pay attention to me, or behave in a certain way, or sit still, or you know, don't ruffle your, open your candy at the wrong time, or you know, there's so much hostility toward audience members that, you know, that we're trying to control them. You can't control people. Um, you can't control social media. You just have to be in it and be of it. We have to occupy a place as storytellers that is part of a community now, I think, unless, you know, we, we, we are writers, and so we're always going to be outside of a community observing it and commenting on it. You know, it's our job to dream the culture forward, as I think Carl Jung said. Uh, although I, I hear it from Mac Rogers, so I, you know, v, as a quote of Carl Jung, so I don't know if that's right. Um, Mac Rogers or Mac Taylor, one of those two. Anyway, uh, it is our responsibility to be connected to our audiences and to not pander to them, to um, offer them opportunities for deeper engagement, but not be hurt if they don't take it, you know. Give, give, give your plays like gifts, and people can do with a gift whatever they want. They can re-gift. If you're really giving a gift, you don't expect them to use it in the way you want them to use it. They may use it in unexpected ways. So in the world of social media, don't, you know, don't obsess about how, uh, how compelling, if your show is so compelling that it makes people turn off their cell phones. You can't control people. Make a compelling show, and if it's right for them to turn off their cell phone, they will. What's the last nugget you want to leave with us before we call it a I, night? Um, in a changing world like this, the people who survive are not the people who cling to familiar things. The people who survive are the people who experiment like my three-year-old, right? That's what three-year-olds are, they're experimenters. I wonder what this radish is gonna taste like in my mouth, oh no! <laughs> <clears throat> um, they try things. They learn from their failures and they fail forward to the, a new and better thing. So try Twitter, try Facebook in a different way don't feel like you're doing it the wrong way or that there is a right way. Just do something. Play. See if you like it. If you don't like it, try something new. If you do like it, do more of it. Um, by all means, tweet to me if you want to. Uh, I'm nice. Tweet to David Lohr. He's nice. Tweet to playwright Steve in the back. He's nice. J. Lynn Roberts. Is that right? She's nice. Um, you know, Seth underscore Eli. I'm kind of nice. <laughs> kind of nice. <clears throat> well, can I can I say thank you then for for doing this tonight? I hope everyone thought this was great. If we missed one of your uh, tweets. Uh
Uh, Woody and I will be pouring over Twitter later tonight, and we'll get to your questions. So I'm sorry if we, we overlooked it this time. Um, but thank you all very much, thank and thanks you. for watching online.